Uh, some of you may remember the, uh, the sitcom, the series Seinfeld. Uh, I was a big fan of that. Uh, but there was an episode of Seinfeld in which Elaine, she gave a gift, a labeling machine, to a guy named uh, Tim Watley. And she later learned that Watley had he'd taken that machine and he rewrapped it and gave it as a gift to Jerry. And then she indignantly branded Watley a re-gifter. <laughs> but she, you know, she really didn't, didn't care for that. And I think we can all relate to that. If somebody gives away our gift or treats our gift as though it's not worth very much, very little to them, it both hurts us and it insults us. It hurts our feelings and it insults us. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with Jacob and Esau from the book of Genesis. These are twins and they're, they're really quite different. Now, they're different both in appearance and in temperament. We read in Genesis chapter 25, verse 27, that Esau, the older one, he's an outdoorsman. He's a skilled hunter, somebody who prefers the open country. And Jacob, on the other hand, he's, he's more of a homebody. He likes to hang out to a quiet man who stayed among the tents. So we have, have Jacob is this aggressive hunter. And Esau, or I'm sorry, Esau's the aggressive hunter, and Jacob is this reflective nomad. I'm more like a Jacob kind of guy, not a big hunter, not a big outdoorsman. <laughs> but you have this difference between them. And we read, if this is going to work, we'll see, I didn't actually try to advance it. <clears throat> did it work? Yes, it did. All right. Yeah. We read in Genesis 25, 29 to 34, it says, Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That's why he also was called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now here we see Esau comes in from a day in the open country. I assume he's been out there hunting all day. And he's very hungry. And he says something like, let me gobble that red stuff down. I'm starving. So he comes in. He's absolutely famished. He says, look, let me have some of that stuff. And Jacob replies, you first, you sell me your birthright. Now Esau's birthright that was his entitlement to a disproportionate share of his father Isaac's estate by virtue of being the firstborn. So Jacob is he's angling to beat his brother out of his inheritance. He's angling to do that. He knows his brother is an impulsive man who acts on his desires, and he's got him right in a situation. And so he's angling to beat him out of his inheritance. He seeks to exploit that situation to his own, ad own advantage. Now Esau, he's so consumed, so consumed by his hunger that he agrees to assign his birthright to Jacob, which decision he rationalizes by saying, look, I'm starving to death. What good is it going to be to me, Dad? So he rationalizes that decision to do that. He just says, look, it's going to be of no value to me, but Jacob knows. He knows that when the edge is gone off Esau's hunger that he's going to seek to renege on the deal. So he knows that. So he says, listen, you swear to me. He makes him seal the deal with an oath because he knew that's how it would play out. So he winds up and he goes ahead and does that. Now, Jacob's exploitation of his brother's situation and his brother's weakness is certainly that's not a noble or a good thing that he did that. But notice who's singled out in the text for explicit disapproval. It's not Jacob. It's Esau. You have the verdict on the whole episode is, so Esau despised his birthright. That's the verdict. In other words, Esau treated his birthright as something that was worth no more than a bowl of stew. He 
chose to give it away in exchange for something worth so little, which was a shameful insult to his father. Jacob took advantage of his brother to gain the birthright, but he at least valued it enough to want it. See, he angled and he took advantage of the situation, exploited his brother, but he at least valued the birthright enough to want it. He saw it. Hey, here you go. Bowl of stew. Go ahead. I'm done with it. First Peter. I know this type's a little small, but I wanted to fit it all in there. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are protected by the power of God, into the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, in which time you will greatly rejoice, though now if it is necessary you've been grieved a little while in various trials, in order that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ whom not having seen you love, in whom not now seeing but believing, you will greatly rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy on receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See, Peter says that Christians have been brought into a living, vibrant, meaningful hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now he means, of course, that our hope has been provided by what Christ endured on our behalf, which is represented by his resurrection. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. You see Peter there, he says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness, by his wound, you were healed. Peter says a bit later in chapter 3, verse 18, because Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. That's right. So this hope into which we've been brought is because of what Christ endured on our behalf, which is represented by the resurrection. Christ died for our sins. And his resurrection demonstrates God's approval of that sacrifice and or is part of the completion of that sacrifice in that the Lord entered heaven itself once for all by his own blood, as the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 9. So and or, you see, it's either the completion of it or it's God's acceptance and vindication in that resurrection. But that's why I see the resurrection as standing for all that Christ endured on our behalf. And he says through the resurrection, we've been brought into this living, vibrant, and meaningful hope. And then he spells out the substance of that hope. He spells it out in two ways. That's why I underline the into and into. I hope it's here. Okay. You see, into, into, into. You see those same prepositions. And what he does, he then elaborates on or he spells out the uh, substance of this living hope into which we've been brought through what Christ endured for us. He says it's an inheritance. It's an inheritance which is a term that presupposes a familial relationship with the Father. You can see that, for example, in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 to 17, Revelation 21, verse 7. The very notion of an inheritance presupposes a familial relationship with the Father. But he says it's an inheritance, and he describes this inheritance as imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. In other words, this inheritance is eternal, it is precious. And it is constant. It is without diminishment. So that's the inheritance that we have. And this inheritance, he says, is kept in heaven. See, which means that it's completely secure. 
the faithful will not on that day find the cupboard empty. So that here you have trusted in Christ your life. You've given Him your life, and on that day it's not going to be, well, what do you know? A uh, bad decision, bad move. The cupboard is empty. That's not how it's going to be. On the contrary, it says the faithful, the faithful are protected by God's power. No contrary power can deny them their inheritance. No contrary power can defeat God's purpose to bless the faithful. As we cling to Christ, no larger power is going to come in and deny what God has intended for His people. He's it. He's the greatest. It's kept in heaven. The cupboard won't be bare. There is no concern about that. Absolutely no concern. He is trustworthy and powerful, and He will deliver on what He's promised to do. And then Peter says, secondly, it's a salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. It's a salvation that's prepared. It's prepared. The salvation is ready, but it won't be revealed by God to mankind generally until the last time, the time of the final judgment. That's, that, that's when that salvation will be revealed. Christ is coming again. He is coming again to consummate or finalize the kingdom that He initiated or inaugurated when He first came. And at that time, see, Christians will be resurrected. We will be raised bodily like Christ the first fruits. And Christians will spend eternity in a redeemed creation, a new heaven and new earth, in a perfect reality of love joy, and fellowship with God and one another. It is the divine utopia. It is the absolute perfect existence. Complete satisfaction. Complete fulfillment. Complete joy. That is the promise that has been given to us as Christians. And the reaction of the saved on that day it's, will be, says, one of tremendous rejoicing. It will be one of tremendous rejoicing. They're suffering now. And we're suffering now, he says, but on that future day, they will greatly rejoice. It'll be a tremendous celebration. Now, with many commentators, I take the in which at the beginning of verse 6 to relate to this last clause that says last time. Okay, so if in which refers to that, then you get in which time. You see, that's why I put the brackets there to let you know what I'm doing. All right, so that's how I, I look at that. I, I think that the in which it there is referring back to the last time, which means in which time. And I also take there's a present tense verb there, greatly rejoice. And I take that to have future meaning, which it can have in this kind of a context, okay? So it says, in which time you will. That's why I put that in brackets, because it's a present tense, but it can have a future meaning in these kinds of situations. But I wanted to tell you, that's what I'm doing. Okay? So, but that's what I think. That's the thrust that I think is there. I think there's this future orientation. That future orientation, in my judgment, it's further supported by the reference in verse 7 to their faith being found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus. You see, it's going to be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus, at His return, at His parousia. So I see that supported there in verse 7 and the reference in verse 9 to receiving the end result of their faith, the salvation of their souls. Now that doesn't mean, you see, that Christians don't rejoice in some deep sense through the sorrow of present trials. We do rejoice in some deep sense through the sorrow of present trials. It means that there is a sense of unparalleled rejoicing that will characterize our entrance into the eternal glory of the consummated kingdom. I, I've said many times, you know, when you sit around in groups like this, or even smaller groups, that on that day, we will be hugging one another. Resurrected people hugging one another and celebrating. Look what our Lord has given us as we come through that. It will be just tremendous joy that we will for eternity reap the promise and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's like, uh, no, we're going to just be busting. Busting. 
And that's what he's talking about here. And then Peter explains that the various trials they were suffering, as Christians have throughout history, because the world hates Christ. And they're suffering. And he explains that Christians are, that the various trials they were suffering, that they were a testing of their faith. You see, he says, like gold is tested so that its genuineness may result in their praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Christ. And you can see, for example, Romans 2.29, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. You can see this idea of our praise and glory and well done, you see, at the return of Christ. And so this is what he's talking about. That's what's in store for the Christian. It is an inheritance like no other. There is no inheritance that can, can compare to this. I don't care what you get. I don't care if you got an uncle that left you a boat and a house and all this stuff and half a Malibu. There is no inheritance that can compare to this. Now look here and what the Hebrew writer says. Oh, it doesn't show up here. Ah, okay. <laughs> Hebrews 12. Pursue peace with everyone. And pursue the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Take care that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he did not find a place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. The Hebrew writer, he warns his fellow Christians. So we're going to bring Jacob and Esau over into the new covenant. And he warns his fellow Christians not to be godless or not to be profane or not to be irreligious like Esau, who sold his birthright, his inheritance rights as the oldest son, for a single meal. And this Hebrew writer is warning us, warning Christians not to despise the priceless inheritance, an inheritance that was secured by the blood of the Son of God. We are not to, you be careful not to be like that. That you wind up despising your birthright. We must not treat the hope of eternal glory as though it were something trivial. We must not treat it that way. Something to be traded away for mere temporary sensual gratification. We must not treat the greatest inheritance ever dreamed of as though it's something just to be traded away for sensual gratification. And don't think there's not plenty of temptation to do that. See, don't think that. Some years ago, nine years ago now, the Kaiser Foundation did a little study of television programs. And they found in 2005 that from 1998, in that seven-year period, that the number of sex scenes on television had doubled. They had, the sex scenes had doubled. Among the 20 shows that were, had the highest teen audience, 70% had sexual content in them. Nearly half included sexual behavior. Eight in ten shows in prime time. Include sexual, and this was nine years ago, and if it doubled from 98 to 2005, what do you think it is now? Just gone completely crazy. See, completely crazy. The trend certainly hasn't slowed down, and sex is as prevalent, if not more so, in movies, on the internet, and you have to see what's going on. See, we human beings, we have a sexual appetite. We have a sexual appetite, and it's like the stew is constantly being passed under our noses. You see? Just constantly being passed under our noses. Our culture, or the spiritual forces behind our culture, relentlessly stokes our sexual appetite in the hope that we'll sell our birthright to satisfy it. That's what's going on. The hope that we will sell this tremendous, unbelievable birthright for a bowl of nothing. They just keep going, aren't you hungry? Aren't you hungry? Come on, man. Come on. Aren't you really famished? Don't you want this? And there are other appeals that are made to sensual gratification in our society. You can think of some. 
Well, you know, think about the pleasure of intoxication. It's all over. Liquor, wine, beer, constantly presented as part of a good time, part of real living. The only way you can have fun and connect with people is if you're drunk, stoned, and within peer groups. You know, you've got people with, you know, ecstasy, uh, LSD, all of these things. Now that's real life, man. That's what's really life. That's cool. That's really having fun. Just passing it under your nose saying, come on. Sell your birthright for this sensual gratification. You see, you see that. Now Esau's rejection of his birthright, that rejection was finalized in Genesis chapter 27 where, where Jacob goes in and he deceives Isaac into bestowing the blessing on him. See, rather than upon Esau... Now the blessing, you've got the birthright and you've got the blessing, and the blessing refers to the covenant blessings that are bestowed by God, which, which by birthright normally would pass to the eldest son. See, just like the inheritance would, just like the birthright would. Normally that's how it would work. To have the blessing is to be in the covenant lineage. It is to be the child of promise. And though Jacob used deception... You remember the story. He used deception to secure the blessing. That was still <coughs> God's rejection of Esau for Esau's earlier rejection of his birthright. Because you see that here. You see, he was rejected. That's a passive. He was rejected. That's God rejected him. It was because of his earlier rejection of his birthright. You see, and all of that was in keeping with the Lord's prophecy to Rebekah that the older would serve the younger. And that's why I said when you look at God moves in mysterious ways, you look and say, he prophesies this, and then you look how this works out. You see, you look how this winds up working out. Well, the Hebrew writer, he stresses the finality. He stresses the finality of the consequences brought on by Esau's rejection of his birthright. Though he cried aloud. You remember the story in Genesis 27. He cried aloud to be given a blessing by Isaac. His rejection was fixed forever by Isaac's pronouncement. No amount of tears could alter the situation. He's weeping. This is what he wants. And the Hebrew writer, see, he wants us to understand that we are playing with fire when we despise our birthright. We are playing with fire when we do that. Though we now have a chance to repent. We have a chance now to repent. The time is coming when the consequence of our choice will be eternally fixed. And on that day, no amount of pleading will alter one's faith. No amount of pleading will alter one's faith. Luke chapter 13, another lot of text on there. Luke 13, 22 to 28, always to me a very sobering text. It says, Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as He made His way to Jerusalem. Someone asked Him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, Make every effort. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter when, and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us! Open the door for us! But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. We had some marginal connection with you. We had some incidental contact and relationship with you. You know, we, we had something to do with you. He says, but he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me all you evildoers, meaning you who have not surrendered your life to me. Does it mean anybody who sins? Of course not. He's using evildoers as those who've turned from him, have not accepted him, haven't bowed to him, haven't given him their lives. So he says, there will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. Now this, this to me is, you know, this is serious business. This is serious. And I have to warn you that if you choose as a Christian to live in rebellion to God, you run the risk. I say, now there's time to repent. Because the door's not closed, but a time is coming when the door will be closed. But I've got to say that if you as a Christian choose to live in rebellion to God, you live in rebellion, you run the risk of disabling 
your repenting apparatus. In other words, you can become so hardened toward God by willfully and knowingly trivializing the sacrifice of His Son that you will move beyond repentance. And that's the state of those people that he talks about in Hebrews chapter 6, 4 to 6, Hebrews chapter 10, 26 to 31. You can disable your repenting apparatus by being so hard against God for so long and trivializing the Son. So there is a danger there. Last text. Hebrews chapter 2, 1 to 3. Therefore we must pay even greater attention to the things that were heard, lest we drift away. For if the word that was spoken by angels was reliable, and every transgression and disobedience received just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? See, this begins, this process begins often as a drifting away. See, this subtle kind of drifting. And I urge, brothers and sisters, I urge you to assess your life honestly before God. And if you've begun to drift, if you started to value the stew of worldly pleasure, of sensual gratification, perhaps even begun to entertain the idea that the stew may be worth the inheritance, I urge you by the Spirit of God to turn around now. Do not trifle with the holiness and the love of God. Now, if there's anything we can do for any of you, you know how we work it. We're going to sing a song. We can pray for you, help you in any way. Come on forward, let me sing.